Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Close to there we go. Come on when you're United Front. Hey folks, we, um, we're going to go in in two minutes, and I'm sorry, we, um, we have more sandwiches coming for folks, um, so I apologize for uh, the lack of sandwiches. More people showed up than we were expecting, so thank you.
All right, folks. Hello. Welcome, everybody. All right, so welcome. I uh, ap apologize for the lack of space and lack of sandwiches. More people showed up than we were expecting. Um, if you were expecting that Jay-Z would be on this panel, uh, I apologize. <laughs> I don't think he was available. Um, but welcome. This is a Congressional Internet Caucus um, Academy briefing. Um, and we do these, we've been doing these things since about 1996. Um, which is a pretty remarkable span of time. Um, these are meant to be informative issues, discussions on critical internet issues as we see them. And um, we try, we're policy agnostic, but we try to provide a good baseline of understanding on some of these key issues. Um, today's panel is in the era of streaming, who's a bigger music mogul, Jay-Z or Congress? And this is hosted in, congressional with the congressional, in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus. Um, and the co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus on the Senate side are uh, Chairman uh, Senator John Thune and Senator Patrick Leahy. And in the House side, it's Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. And um, just recently, a few weeks ago, um, Congresswoman Eshoo announced that um, Congressman Doug Collins from Georgia would be the new co-chair on the House side of the Congressional Inner Caucus, and we're thrilled um, to have him. The reality is that for members hosting, uh, participating in briefings and hosting uh, briefings in conjunction with us, um, without any particular you know, policy approach or, or advocacy is really a brave thing to do, and they just want to have more in information and more education on these really difficult issues. So um, I, I really appreciate um, their help and their support um, on, on that kind of mission. So um, my name is Tim Lorden, and I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus uh, Academy. Um, for a little bit of housekeeping, um, we'll be live streaming this, and it'll be on C-SPAN today um, live um, on cspan.org, but also um, on, tonight um, on, on primetime on on C-SPAN television. The hashtag today is uh, Music Moguls, and you can follow along at NetCaucusAC. We will also podcast the audio and video of this um, afterwards. Um, so let me, let me just start off by kind of setting the stage here. Um, it's, this is supposed to be an educational event. Um, it, we are using the kind of title of who's a music mogul, Jay-Z, Congress, as to illustrate the fact that um, what a lot of people don't know is that since the beginning, um, Congress has been very, very, very involved um, in music. And a lot of people don't know that, and a lot of people don't understand where Congress is involved in the federal government, and Congress has oversight of those things. But you'd be kind of surprised to find that out, and we're going we're gonna to go into more detail on that um, in just a, just a minute. Um, so, as far as the speakers go, let me just, I'll introduce the speakers in a second, but there, there's a lot of players in this marketplace, and it's really hard to understand, and I, I apologize, there should be about 20 people up here at least, um, representing different perspectives, we just didn't really have the, the space or the time to do that. So, um, uh, this is a good group of folks, um, and, and let me just introduce them, like, kind of alphabetically. Um, to my right is, is Danielle Aguirre. She's the Executive Vice President, General Counsel of the National Music Publishers Association. Um, next to her is Kevin Erickson from the Future of Mo Music Coalition, and Kevin is, um, he's an artist, he's a songwriter, and he's a producer. Um, and, and, and then um, next to him is Julia Massimino, who is the Vice President of Global Pug Policy for Sound Exchange, and she'll explain kind of what that is and um, what, that, what that organization does. And then uh, next to her is um, Curtis Leggett, who is the um, Executive, Vice President, Executive Vice President of the um, National Association of Broadcasters. And then finally at the end, um, Ali Sternberg, who's the Senior Policy Counsel for the Computer and Communications Industry Association. And in her own right, um, Sally is a, singer, uh, Ali is a singer and songwriter. So we're thrilled to have um, of this group of folks. Um, I, guess, I guess we'll just define like what a music mogul is. You know, there's money, right? Jay-Z, Forbes just reported recently that Jay-Z is worth a billion dollars. Um, that's, that's a lot. Um, Congress's net worth, I, I don't know what its net worth is. It spends a lot. I don't know what it's worth, but we can argue about that later. Obviously, when it comes to moguls, influence is really important. The cultural impact of Jay-Z and people like Taylor Swift and, and, and other folks like that is just really, it's part of our national fabric um, song and music. It's really, really hard to quantify that. Um, but I think for the purposes of this panel, we'll, we'll probably talk about like your, your power to control 
your creativity and your, and your music. Um, and I think that's kind of where it gets a little bit interesting, um, you know, where over the course of the last two centuries, uh, Congress has tried to get involved to, to, to be a part of how musicians get compensated, um, how they can control their copyright, and, and that's really the heart of what we're talking about as a music mogul, like who, has, who can control music and the like. So um, just, just to go way back, like 200,000 years, um, since the beginning of the species, uh, song and music has been such an important part of who we are as human beings. Um, it's been around to tell stories, um, to tell our history, to inspire us. It's really hard to underestimate the, the impact and influence of music and song when it comes to us as a species. But it hasn't been until recently that we were able to start kind of controlling um, our music. Uh, 200,000 years ago when the first Homo sapiens were uh, telling stories through music, um, they weren't able to copyright them and they weren't able to record them. Uh, but fortunately at the beginning of the Republic here in the United States in about 17, 1790, there was the first Copyright Act. And during that time, Congress actually gave a copyright for um, the composition, the notes and the, and, and the lyrics um, of the music that somebody would write. And that was in, that was in 1790. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't until about, you know, um, about 100 years later that Thomas Edison um, gave us the ability to kind of capture the, the performance of that sound, of that song, onto a phonograph. And we've been kind of recording it on different media ever since, and that was, that was a recently new development. And then finally, you know, over the, past, the last century, the last century or so, we, had, we created new ways to kind of take that sound recording of that music and transmit it to larger audiences. Um, so we had broadcast radio came about in the early part of the you know, 20th century. Um, then we had um, cable television. Then we kind of launched satellites into space. Um, and then eventually the internet came along. So there's been all this, this new development on how we can kind of uh, transmit the sound recording. And that's where it gets really complicated. Um, it was pretty easy 200,000 years ago. Nobody had any rights to do anything with their music. They just sang songs around the campfire. It's a little more complicated today. Um, so to, on the way over here, we all took, we took an Uber from my office. And um, the Uber driver was really chatty. He asked me, where are you going? What, what's going on in Rayburn? Because he could see our destination in the app. And I said, uh, we're going to talk about music moguls and Congress. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, no, no, really. He's like, well, what's that about? And I said, well, it turns out that, like, look at your dashboard here. And he, was, he had his apps all displayed on his smart panel and things like that. He, I said, every button that you see there is, is kind of controlled by a different regulatory regime. And artists and songwriters and, and music publishers are compensated probably differently depending on the button you push. So let's say you were going to play um, I'm All About the Bass by Megan Trainer, right? And let's say we had that one song and you were to play that, if you could, on every single button you had. The composition for that would be very different for each one of those services. You have a button that's, um, for instance, he had a, a Spotify app. On his, on his dashboard, and that's what we would call interactive music streaming. It means he, you can actually specify which songs you want to listen to, whether it's Megan Trainer or whether it's Justin Bieber, you can actually make your playlist. And then there was a, Sp a Pandora app on his, on his dashboard, and that's what we call non-interactive streaming. Kind of just kind of streams to you. You can't kind of control it. Maybe you can like fast forward it, or I don't like that song, but basically you get what you get. It just keeps coming at you, right? And then there's uh, another button that was his, um, I think he had his iTunes playlist. So the mu music that he downloaded, um, he was able to play his entire playlist. And that's kind of on a diff different regime because that's actually songs that he has a copy of and he's stored on his car computer. And then lastly, not lastly, um, then there's the, the FM button. So if you were to press it and get really lucky and Megan Trainer comes on, uh, that's the same song, but that's, under a, that's over the broadcast airwaves. That, uh, Curtis's people run, and it kind of comes into your car with a tuner. It's analog, and you just kind of tune your dial to it, and it catches that, 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 that analog um, transmission, and that's a different rate. I think I've kind of captured his entire dashboard. I might have missed one. I'm not going to talk about satellite. Because then, there's, uh, then there's an SM, a Sirius XM satellite radio button, and that's regulated a little bit differently, too. We're not going to talk about cable because it's kind of hard to drive with a cable attached to your car. Um, or, so, but basically, that's, that's kind of it. 
that's, that's kind of the, the, the he, was, he looked at me like I was nuts, but it's actually true. Like, you, and we don't think about that when we walk down the street or get in our car and listen to music. We just listen to it. We don't really give it much thought. But behind the scenes, Congress is heavily involved. And um, to kind of flesh this out a little bit more on who the players are in the space so we have a better understanding, um, let me just go to Kevin Erickson. He's going to kind of like lay out like who the players are, who they are, and what the copyrights are involved in this. Well, so uh, last year as I was running around the hill working on the Music Modernization Act, I had enough staffers say, oh, this is so complicated. Can you explain it to me like I'm five? And so I got some puppets. Um, <laughs> and so like... This is Sally the songwriter. Sally the songwriter, she comes up with notes and lyrics, and she can write those notes and lyrics down on paper. She's written this really great song. And um, so to market that song, to bring it out to the marketplace, to potentially get TV and movie syncs, but also just get it out to audiences, she partners with a publisher. So let's see, so we've got a pub publisher here. And so the publisher's job, she's good is to, uh, she's very good at her job. Uh, she helps get that uh, out to audiences and gets it, um, you know, she can potentially uh, approach recording artists to see if they want to record that song. Do you want to hold your constituent here? <laughs> <laughs> Got a hat for her. Okay, and so she does a really good job and she's able to get, um, oops, hats are flying everywhere already. These are all under the table right now. Yeah. So we got Ricky, the recording artist here, and he agrees to record the song. Um, and so he uh, goes into the studio, and he comes out of the studio with a completed sound recording. Now this is a different copyright than the notes and the words on paper, and the money, the revenue for it flows differently. So Ricky comes out of the studio with this uh, sound recording. Now, hold on to Ricky there. <laughs> Ricky's losing his hat. Ricky partners with a record label. The record label helps Ricky uh, market that sound recording. And often they fund the sound recording and so they own the master for the sound recording. They own the intellectual property right embedded in that sound recording. I, wanted, I want you to notice that their hats, can you hold two of them? Yeah. I want you to notice that their hats are different colors here because we've got two sound recordings. Red hats here, those are the notes and the words, the, the musical composition. These teal hats, those are the sound recording. The uh, performance is captured by microphones um, to a, a magnetic tape or to an audio file in the recording studio. Um, when you think through licensing, it's really helpful to think through these two copyrights separately because the licensing and compensation works differently for each one. Money from the comp uh, composition goes to Sally and the publisher. Money from the sound recording goes to Ricky, the recording artist, and the record label. Um, in most cases, a company that wants to use music has to arrange a license for both the composition and the sound recording. They have to make sure that both Sally and Ricky get paid. Um, there is one big exception uh, with terrestrial radio, and I'm sure we'll get to that. Now, sometimes a single person will play multiple roles. For example, Sally may decide, I'm really talented, I'm going to choose to record my own song, and I'm actually comfortable publishing it and releasing it commercially myself. So she's going to act as her own publisher and record label. So she would be wearing all four of these hats. But in that case, it's still helpful in understanding how the licensing works to think through each one of those revenue streams differently, think through each one of those roles. Um, alternatively, sometimes a lot of people work together to create a musical composition. So you might have 10 different songwriters working together to write a song with 10 different publishers representing them. And it's important to create systems that ensure that all of those folks get whatever money they've earned in those, in those uh, circumstances. So Congress's role then has a lot to do with determining how much, if anything, each of these four puppets gets paid and how the money gets to them. This also means that Congress has a role in determining what kind of music services exist, what their offerings are, how much they cost, and whether they have any special obligations to the listening public in terms of localism, diversity, user privacy, uh, consumer disclosures about sponsorship. Um, 
Congress can do this sometimes directly and then sometimes in their oversight role over uh, the federal agencies that have jurisdiction. Um, and then as new technologies are adopted, there are new ways that music gets to listeners. Um, to mention that music licensing works different ways for different kinds of services, and that has meant uh, new laws that set up systems that make sure that the money goes where it's suppo supposed to go. So like performing rights organizations like ASCAP and BMI. Um, if I'm ASCAP and BMI, I go around to di um, different kinds of services. I collect money from them and look red hat. So I, I take that money and I pay Sally the songwriter and I pay the publisher. Um, that was, that was, those first really were set up in the early days of radio. Now we have four um, major performing rights organizations on the composition side, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and GMR. Um, and then uh, later on, uh, Julia will talk more about this, but Sound Exchange was set up, so Teal Hat. Sound Exchange's job is to pay these guys, the artist and the label. There you go. I'll let you have your hat. Um, and then most recently, as a part of the Music Modernization Act, uh, a new body called the MLC was set up, and when that's fully operational, their job will be to collect um, mechanical royalties uh, in the digital space from services like Spotify, Apple Music. Um, and these will be paid to the publisher, and then the publisher in turn will pay the songwriter. Um, I think that's good. That's a good start. That is a good start. <laughs> okay, and, and I, I, one of the, you know, Thank you, Kevin. I was a little nervous about that, but that was great. Um, I, I think one of the things I mentioned that there are a lot of people that are not re represented up there, and it's a huge oversight that we don't have a, uh, a performance rights organization up here, a PRO. Um, as, as Kevin mentioned, that's either um, ASCAP or BMI, um, and there's two other ones, like the acronyms for which I can't remember. Um, but basically, um, can someone, exp let me, let's, I'll maybe have Danielle explain at some point um, uh, why they came into existence, but right, right now, let's just go to um, Allie really quickly to kind of like elaborate on um, the sound, the, the, the sound recording side. I think you know, recently you might have heard that Taylor Swift had, um, had been upset that her first four albums, the sound recordings, the masters, had, been, um, had left her control. So maybe, um, Allie, you can explain like what that means, and, and uh, Kevin just had the tape um, of, the, of a fictional sound recording there. So, Allie? Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to follow up on Kevin's presentation. Um, so as Kevin mentioned, there are the two copyrights. Uh, there's the, the composition, musical work, which is um, the, it's the songwriter writes a song. They have the musical copyright once it's fixed in, in sheet music or in a recording. Um, and that often, as he, he showed kind of all the different um, intermediaries that help license out the different rights. Um, and then there's the sound recording side, which the um, is the artist and the label, that, that kind of side. But one thing that we haven't really discussed yet is that in, in addition to music, music copyright is really complicated. So in addition there to the uh, copyright is often described as a bundle of rights. So, it, so if, you, if you're the copyright owner, you get the exclusive right to do a bunch of different things. There's the right to reproduce, right to distribute, right to publicly perform, right to publicly display, right to prepare derivative works, um, those are the main ones. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is just the public performance part of it. Um, private performance, if you're singing in the shower, you don't have to worry about copyright, that's fine. Um, but the, the public performance part um, is a lot of what Kevin was explaining, um, how these various different entities will help license out these rights to the services um, in order to make sure that the artist is getting compensated. Uh, another thing we're not getting into as much today is that this also affects any place where music is played. So that's both um, restaurants and bars that have just uh, the radio or, or Spotify or Pandora or other services playing in there. Uh, it includes live music. There's so many, um, so that, and live music is played a lot of different establishments as well. Um, so a lot of times these, ven these different venues will have these blanket licenses to, to help distribute these. Um, so the, as, um, as we mentioned, the sound recording copyright was, has been in the news a little bit lately. There's been talk of masters. So the master is, is um, the individual the sound recording. Once it's completed, everyone, all the different people at the um, music producers, labels, it's all been completed. That's fixed in this master. So 
We're talking about copyright a lot today, but there's also a lot of intersection with other areas of law, including contract law, employment law. There's so many different um, intersections that um, copyright intersects with. So the master recording, um, a lot of times when artists, especially at the beginning of their career, they'll sign with different stakeholders in order to help fund their making music. But an, an, it's pretty standard for artists to not own these master recordings. Um, sometimes when you're later in your career, there's um, ways to have the rights terminated back to you or you can have the power to buy them back when you're a music mogul like Jay-Z or Prince Rihanna, some of the artists that have bought back their masters. But Taylor Swift was not able to, um, and so she kind of, um, she had written about it, there was some controversy about it, and I think that that sh shows just that even with people that have power, it can be really complicated figuring out um, who is able to retain these important um, pieces of music, but also um, it, it was the right, the right with Taylor Swift was really just being transferred from one owner, that's not her, uh, at Big Machine, I think, to Scooter Braun, his holding company. So it didn't really change that much for her, but it really helped that um, people talking about this issue a lot. Another thing that happened with Masters recently, there, um, you might have heard that there was, there was new, um, reporting about a big fire that happened back in 2008, but um, we didn't really find out about it till a few weeks ago, and that just, that involved a lot of master recordings from some really iconic pre-1972 music, so it was really devastating, a universal music fire. Um, but uh, the Music Modernization Act, as I think we're going to talk a little bit about more later, did um, change some of the things that um, affect day-to-day -day music distribution, music reproduction, um, and are going to help to bring together these different players, some of which are here. Um, there, I guess Tim said there are so many people that are affected by music and that own different pieces of the music marketplace puzzle. Um, but yeah, that bill really, it, um, as some of you may know, if you were in Congress or I'm working in Congress, interning in Congress last year, that was a pretty um, big thing that happened last year was that there was this consensus bill where it changed some of these important music rules and it built on a lot of the history that we know that um, Congress had done in the past. And so they weren't starting from scratch, so part of it is that, um, is that they're dealing with rules that were written for player pianos and, and then trying to figure out how does this apply to streaming. So it's a, it's a really big challenge, but they, uh, a lot of people came in the room together and passed a consensus bill last year that I think we'll talk more about later. Yeah, so Thomas Edison gave us the ability to record a sound record sound into a sound recording like Taylor Swift's uh, Masters. And then over the years, layer, like new technologies came along to take that sound recording and transmit it to audiences like radio, uh, radio broadcast, um, uh, telephone, the internet, um, satellites. And that's where things, as that happens over a period of time, like Congress kind of jumps in to deal with that new technology and, and, and try to figure this all out. And that's why it might be a little bit complicated. Um, so um, Ali just talked about the sound recording and um, the, the performance right. And then when you take that sound recording and you send that over the internet or over broadcast, it's a, it's a public performance. Um, the other part of the copyright, as Kevin uh, detailed, is the actual notes that are written down. Um, and actually created. And so the people that represent them are the National Music Publishers Association in part. Um, that's all your members. Um, they're a, 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 not every, every, not every you know, songwriter is part of your membership, but a lot are. Um, so Dan Danielle, if you could explain, kind of elaborate on the composition copyright and what it means and why it's important in the different types of, of transmissions that we have. Sure. Hey, everyone. I'm Danielle. Um, I'm from the National Music Publishers Association. Uh, we represent publishers um, and their songwriting partners. Uh, I'll get into it a little bit more, but um, there is a, uh, a very well-known songwriter based out of Nashville named Lee Thomas Miller, and he says often, he's testified on the Hill a number of times, that songwriting is America's smallest small business, and it's true. Um, but it also happens to be one of the most heavily regulated um, by Congress. Um, it has almost 75% of its revenue uh, regulated uh, by Congress through various laws, as well as um, what I'll get into later, consent decrees that are governed by the Department of Justice. Um, and it's a very small industry. It's a, the entire industry 
both publishers and songwriters, is probably a two to three billion dollar industry in the United States. And if you think about how you listen to music today, uh, whether it's Spotify or Apple Music or Sirius XM, you're, you know that any of those companies individually um, have multiple billions more than our entire industry and yet are not as heavily regulated. And so it is interesting because when you think about um, how you listen to music, what you probably don't know is how music is originally created by songwriters and then help to be distributed by publishers who help songwriters in a lot more ways than just distribution. They give advances to help songwriters create music and live um, while they're creating music. They help them partner with other writers so that they can write songs. They help them partner with artists so that they can record the songs. Um, all of that is heavily regulated. And for the most part, the royalties that are received by songwriters and music publishers are set by the government, um, they're calculated by the government, and they're calculated in proceedings that people like me at NMPA and others have to go to every few years to um, actually almost do a trial to set what the rates will be. And so, you know, when I was thinking about this panel and thinking about, you know, who's the bigger music mogul, Jay-Z or Congress, you know, I think when you're thinking about Jay-Z's sound recordings, you're thinking, I don't know, he's, he's pretty powerful. Um, but the funny thing is, if you think about him for the songs that he's written, he's probably not as big of a music mogul as you think. Because for most of his rights, for most of the songs that are played over Spotify or Apple Music, he doesn't have a chance to say, no, you can't use my songs if you don't pay me the rate that I think is a fair rate he has to let those digital services use the songs and distribute the songs as a songwriter. And so very briefly, because I think they've gotten into this a lot already, we're gonna talk about two of the rights. There are a number of other rights, but two of the rights um, today. One is called the mechanical right, and that really is the copying and distribution. So going way back to the mid 90s, um, we're talking about CDs, literally pressing CDs and distributing them. Um, we're talking about downloading songs on Apple Music. Now we're talking about interactive streaming on Spotify or Apple Music or Google Play or any other Pandora Plus. Um, you are talking about actually copying and distributing those sound recordings. Because in order to play a song on Spotify, because you, you have your playlist on Spotify, a copy has to be made of that, right? That's exactly As right. opposed to like broadcast radio where it's just kind of streaming at you, analog, and it just disappears, you know, if you don't catch it. Right. And so the uh, mechanical right was first uh, set in 1909, um, as Ali said, for player piano roles. And up until recently, probably actually worked fairly well. Um, most of the time, it would be record labels would send a notice to a copy, a songwriter or their publisher and say, we want to use this song, we want to license it, here's the compulsory license because it is a, it's a compulsory license under section 115 of the Copyright Act. And they would say, and we'll pay you the compulsory statutory rate and they would play the song and it would be great. Uh, then you had Spotify and Google and a lot of other interactive streaming services saying, we don't need one license, we don't need 10, we need 30 million. And it became a lot more complicated to serve individual compulsory licenses for 30 million songs or musical works. Um, we'll get into how we've tried to fix that in the Music Modernization Act in a little bit. Then you have perform performance rights. And those are represented by performing rights organizations, the two largest being ASCAP and BMI, uh, the other two being GMR and CSAC. Um, ASCAP and BMI are um, governed in large part by um, a regulatory structure set up in 1941 through consent decrees that were entered into with the Department of Justice. Does anybody know what a consent decree is? Um, it's when uh, the Department of Justice, from a competition perspective, jumps in and says, well, you guys control all these songs, and there might be some uh, competition issues. So they bundled ASCAP and BMI. Each, of has, each has separate licenses for these works. Um, and they brought them into a consent decree um, so that 
um, they could oversee the competition aspects of those holdings. So those 1941 consent decrees still exist today. Um, and today, performance royalty rates are set by two federal judges in the Southern District of New York, um, where royalty rates can't be agreed to through negotiation with licensees. And for performing rights, that's almost everything you listen to on your car dashboard. That is interactive streaming services, that is Pandora, it's XM Sirius, it's almost everything. That is a, that implicates a performance right for which songwriters get paid. Um, so I don't know if you want me to stop No, that, that, there. that's good, and I think, um, uh, I apologize for not having a performance rights organization up here like ASCAP BMI. Um, I, I think you know, they would articulate it as, um, and I, I hope I don't mis misstate this, is that you know, in a lot of ways musicians, when it comes to their, their rights, um, they could go around individually. Like Jay-Z could write a song, and he could go in around individually to every one of the, how many broadcast radio stations are there, Curtis? 14,000. <laughs> Jay-Z could go all of them and try to negotiate a contract with them. And then, uh, then he could go to all the other different venues that are playing his music and try to negotiate a rate. Um, but, you know, it's like I think Jay-Z decided he was going to join ASCAP. I believe he's a member of ASCAP. And that they kind of do that for him. Um, and that's kind of why those performance rights organizations exist, because Jay-Z kind of wants to focus on the, the art and not negotiating with every broadcaster. Curtis? Yeah. And I think what's important to state about all of this is you're, you're hearing this is unquestionably a complicated landscape, and it's further complicated by the fact that sort of each segment of the landscape is treated differently. A lot of it has to do with historical anachronisms. You've got Congress having a hand in one piece. As Danielle points out, you've got a Justice Department consent decree that governs the, pu the public performance right with musical works. But I think if you step back from it, what you are looking at is this, that you have a lot of rights holders in this space. And as a broadcaster, a streaming service, a restaurant, a bar, any one of whom is publicly performing music and is subject to either one or both of the copyrights and the need to secure permissions under, uh, you know, as ascribed by law, it is just incomprehensible as to how any licensee would do that. And from the rights holders perspective, uh, there's a real policy interest in ensuring that it is not just going to be the rights holder that's affiliated with a major record label or a major pub music publisher who is able to get their music out in the ecosystem, but you want everyone to have that access. So for better or for worse, there, the different areas of this law are really put together to attempt to enable efficient, pro-competitive licensing from the licensee side, but also the ability of rights holders to get their, their music out there in a world where you're talking about millions of works, millions of rights, and this could easily, I think, skew into, into a landscape that is dominated by major players. And luckily, that's not what we have, uh, for the most part in, part, in the music space in this country. Said eloquently by somebody whose members are not regulated as heavily as ours. So <laughs> I, I, I would I would disagree with that. Every station in this country has to go to the FCC and get a license before we can before we can even go and and you know say we're open for business. So I'm not sure that there is an industry in this country more regulated than television and radio broadcasts. All right, Curtis, let me, before I, before I get there, um, since this is the Congressional Internet Caucus, um, let's talk about the Internet. Um, in 1995, which was um, a year before the Congressional Internet Caucus was created, it was before the landmark uh, Telecommunications Act of 1996, which actually really didn't mention much of the Internet, um, there was um, something called the, um, the Digital, Digital Performance Right and Sound Recordings Act of 1995. And as Ali kind of said, and, and following up on Kevin, there really wasn't a copyright for the, sound re uh, the performance of the sound recording. Um, but Congress kind of stepped in in 1995 to deal with some of these digital issues, right, and digital streaming. 
Um, and when I say streaming, kind of like the Pandora model or the, the cable music model where it, the stream, stream just comes to you song after song after song. You kind of pick a genre maybe, but you can't select which playlist you, what actual songs you want to play. So um, Julia is very involved in, in her, her organization, Sound Exchange, is kind of a function of that act in 1995. And Julia, if you could explain what that act did and how your organization came into being. Sure. Um, so we're going back just to, because I love what Ke the way that Kevin laid this out, because it really is, like, you have to remember that there are two separate copyrights. So Sound Exchange works um, was, was created at our founding. We were about making sure that artists and their record labels um, were compensated for the use of their sound recordings. Um, I was going to start talking about the 1995, these two, two laws were passed, one in 1995 and one in 1998, by saying we're really going into ancient history. But when Tim started talking about his Uber and saying 200,000 years ago, I realized that this, doesn't, this isn't that much ancient history, <laughs> but, it, but it feels like it now. Um, because in 1990, if you think about the music services that were popping up um, and music being um, distributed over the internet in 1995 and in 1998, we're really different landscape and really different players than we have now. So in 1995, Sound recordings were the only performable copyrighted work that did not have a performance right in US law. So that means that at that time, Ricky, the, the recording artist, and his label didn't have a right to be paid when their sound recording was played, whether that meant, whether that was over the radio or over a digital music service. Um, so just for perspective, the kinds of works that did have a performance right and do have a performance right. Musical compositions, motion pictures, dramatic works, plays, literary works, and pantomimes and choreographic works. <laughs> pantomimes have a performance right in, under US copyright law, but sound recordings did not. And so in 1995, members of Congress were hearing about new digital music technologies like satellite and cable music um, services, and the reality that those distribution of music over those services was likely and was already disrupting the ability of recording artists and record labels' ability to recoup their creative investments and in their work. So right at that moment, that they were making um, returns on their investments in that work through physical sales, through CD sales, and um, and so Congress stepped in at that point and created a new framework, and that new framework came in the Digital Performance Right and Sound Recordings Act of 1995, and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, or the DMCA. And so I'm, those two laws did a lot of things in U.S. copyright law, but since Tim's asking me to talk about sound exchange and treatment of sound recordings, I'm gonna talk about four things that those two huge laws did. Um, first, importantly, they granted a performance right in sound recordings for digital audio transmissions only. So not the full performance right that, um, that musical compositions enjoy, but only for digital audio transmissions. So that means performances or plays on, on um, digital music services, satellite music services, cable music, so the stations that are way at the top of your cable, um, it, on your cable box, if you have a cable box still, um, webcasting services like Pandora, uh, satellite radio, I would say like Sirius XM, but it is in the United States only Sirius XM, and also Curtis's constituents, FM radio stations that simulcast online. So, so when they simulcast digitally, the, yes. the radio, okay. Right. So if I am sitting at my desktop listening as I did when I first moved to Washington, D.C., and I listened to my favorite radio station from home in Texas, that's, that's what we're talking about. You wish you would still about. do that. I don't, don't think that I don't still do that. I'm not going to give a shout out to the station, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... 
At, la at long last, there is finally a performance right for sound recordings in law, thanks to these two laws in 1995 and 1998. And in exchange for that new right, sound recording copyright owners were subjected to a compulsory license for the use of their music by non-interactive digital music services who complied with a bunch of other regulations under the law that I don't want to go into right now. But I want to make sure everybody understands what those two things mean. Yeah, and if you could First, explain what uh, compulsory means. Right, that's yeah. where I'm going to start because Danielle talked about a compulsory license, and this is hard because we have done, in the, because you know, we were all worked together on the Music Modernization Act, we have done hundreds of meetings about this subject, so sometimes it's hard to remember. There are terms that, don't, you know, that aren't intuitive. A compulsory license means, so here's this, this industry that has waited for decades and decades to get a performance right in US law, but in exchange for getting that limited digital performance right, they, get a, they were also subjected to a compulsory license, and what that means is they are required under the law to let services that I'm going to define in just a second use whatever music they want. So they get the performance right, but they don't have the right to control who is using the sound recording. It is a compulsory license, and people also refer to this as a statutory license. It's in the statute. And so and it is for non-interactive, and you talked about this a little bit, Tim, that means basically radio-like. It's not on demand. You can't decide what the next song you're going to hear is. You might be able to say, I want to hear recordings like this one, but you can't decide the exact thing you're going to hear next. So compulsory license for non-interactive digital music services, and royalties um, collected under that license, under the law, were split 50-50. Half of the royalties went to the copyright owner, who is usually the record label, um, although there are many artists today who own their own master recordings. Usually when we say copyright owner on the sound recording side, it means the record label, and 50% to the artist. 5% of that artist share um, under this and for these royalties, and this is all in the in section 114 of the Copyright Act. So people refer to this as the 114 license. Five percent of those royalties on the artist side also go to a fund called the AFM SAG AFTRA Fund, and that fund, those royalties are distributed to all of the non-featured performers on the recording. So backup vocalists, backup musicians, and that is unique in the recording industry that those artists share in the royalty stream from the recordings. Okay, so the third thing that, this did, that these two laws did related to sound recordings is it also, because the performance right was created, it, created, it, it, it established the ability for um, copyright owners to enter into voluntary licensing agreements or direct licensing agreements because for services that were, were not eligible to use this new compulsory license. So now you have services that want to use everything and you have service uh, and can use this brand new compulsory license and you have services that maybe want to have be on demand or you have services that want the right to play a whole album straight through. Um, they can go to the copyright owner directly and try to negotiate a license. So just pausing for a second there, that means if you want to start a digital music service in the United States, you have two choices. You can push the easy button <laughs> and you go over to the copyright office and say, hey, I'm starting this service up and I'm planning to rely on the 114 license. And they will tell you, go to Sound Exchange. We, you've, you've given us notice. You've paid this, I think, I think it's $25 or something. You've answered three multiple choice questions about your service, and the rest of it you're going to deal with Sound Exchange to pay the royalties. Or you can start a, a non, a, a, an interactive service, or you want some other spe special capability than what's required to use the compulsory license. And then you go to every copyright owner for those sound recordings that you want to use, and you negotiate a licensing agreement. So you can see that this created some efficiency for services that wanted to get off the ground quickly. 
Um, as long as they're non-interactive. That's correct. All right. So the, other, the fourth thing that these two laws did is Congress looking and, and realizing we're creating, you know, what we're, the system we're creating here is going to be millions and really in billions of small transactions between many, 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 many tens of thousands of people. So they called for a collective to be formed to administer that license and all of those transactions. Um, and so uh, in, in 2000, that the industry started forming that collective. And in 2003, Sound Exchange became the independent not-for-profit collective um, that with full representation of the industry on its board. We have an 18-member board. It is half copyright owners uh, and their representatives and half representatives of artists, um, both artist unions. Um, we have two artists on our board, artist representatives, managers, lawyers. And since 2003, we have been this independent collective with the duty to represent the entire industry before the Copyright Royalty Board that sets royalty rates for all of the types of services um, that want to avail themselves of this compulsory license. We, you can imagine at the time, there wasn't, this, when this license came into being, there wasn't a single registered artist. So we established this collective. Here we are, fast forward 16 years, we have 180,000 plus accounts that, rep that we pay royalties into, representing copyright owners and artists. We're collecting royalties from 3,000 plus services that are using, they're relying on the compulsory license. And we now have a repertoire database of sound recordings in the tens of millions. And we also administer some of those direct licensing agreements because we have built this platform for that. Okay. So essentially, the, the, the statute, the 90, 1995 performance, Digital Performance Rights in Sound Recording Act, in a way, created your organization. It's a, yeah, it, yeah. Sure, it called yeah. for the creation of the organization, and it created this platform on which all of digital music streaming is okay. exploded. Um, we have like uh, 15 minutes left, I think, or just a little bit less, so I want to go for some questions about um, uh, this issue uh, to the audience in just a minute. But is it too late, for, uh, too, too early for me to go to before the more MMA discussion? Um, to my Uber driver and his dashboard and kind of explain like if, if he presses the Spotify yeah. app and plays Jay-Z song and let's say Jay-Z actually wrote the music but it was performed by somebody else or but how much does you know how much does he get paid for that is there a statutory sure so for, on the sound recording you want to if, if it's, if it's Spotify, let's say it's the Spotify button let's do let's do sound recording. I, why don't I okay. run through that dashboard really quickly? Just for really sound quickly, recording, and then you want to do it for okay. Because no one's so, taking notes on exactly how much, and I'm not trying to say that people aren't paid enough. No. Um, but just to give an example, I don't want to get into the rates. Yeah, <laughs> but just you can roughly. find them all in Sound Exchange's website. Okay, excellent memos about them. Um, okay. But if you you're sitting at this, this dashboard, and this is where it's going to get fun for Curtis. <laughs> If you have a car that's newer than mine, and you have a screen like your Uber like, driver Yeah, it's amazing. And you touch the Pandora button, let's say, you are um, the, the artist, the, the, yes, Ricky and his label are being paid a, at a rate set by the Copyright Royalty Board under a standard of fair market value, of a willing buyer, willing seller, which is the closest we can come to fair market value under a government regulated system. Pandora, well, I'll switch over to SiriusXM. Pandora has direct licensing agreements now, too, but um, so you, you wanted Spotify. Yeah, Spotify is entirely directly licensed. It does not rely on the compulsory license. So it is getting, the, the performer and record label are getting rates negotiated by the copyright owner and decided upon between, negotiated between Spotify and the copyright owner. Um, if you touch the Sirius XM, the And Sirius XM radio. comes to you from a satellite in orbit. Like, it's just not more than just a dashboard. It's like actually a satellite that's up there and it's transmitting um, down to your car. One of the bizarre twists of legislative history in the 95 and 98 laws that I was talking about earlier is that Sirius XM came to, or, which was then Sirius and XM, 
um, came to Congress and argued, we're just putting satellites in the air. You can't, we weren't planning on paying for music. You're, this is a surprise. <laughs> you can't surprise us this way. Um, so they negotiated to get a below market rate. So for 20 years, until last year when the MMA was passed, copyright owners on the sound recording side, performers and record labels, were forced by the government to turn their music over to satellite radio services and accept a below market rate for their use because they had come to Congress in 20 years ago and negotiated a, basically a coupon from the government for their use. Well, yeah. I, I, one, of the, one of the people missing for this panel are like Sirius XM, so I apologize. Uh, we, uh, but They should be here. But here's the thing, that was fixed in the MMA. And it's one of the really important things that was fixed in the MMA that, that isn't mentioned much because there were big changes in that bill. And so now, going forward, when rates are set for Sirius XM, they will pay a rate that's set at fair market value, which is a good thing. Um, and then, and, and then if you're listening to FM radio... And anybody can jump in on this one. If, you, if, the, if the Uber driver presses a Jay-Z song on FM radio. So if you are listening to, to Jay-Z over the air, um, on the sound recording side, the FM station pays nothing and never has paid anything. So no recording artist has ever gotten a penny from FM radio because there is not a performance right that covers FM radio. The sound recording. And Dan Danielle, does on the publisher side um, on broadcast radio, on the, the FM button, does Jay-Z get paid as a publisher? Yes, he would get paid a um, performance royalty for the performance of the song over the radio. And that, that rate is dictated by? Well, if, um, if Curtis's uh, members can't reach agreements voluntarily with the PROs, ASCAP and BMI, um, Particularly, they go to a rate court, and they have almost like a trial to determine what the rate is. Okay. Yes. And Curtis? Yeah, so uh, agree with Danielle. Obviously, that characterization, our industry pays hundreds of millions of dollars to, to the PROs on the musical work side. I do want to speak to the sound recording piece. I mean, as, as everyone in this room is well aware, Congress is about the gives and takes of balance, balancing policy and broadcast radio and policymakers we have seen for decades recognize the value of what our members do that is distinct from every other service that's been discussed over the course of this panel because what we offer is completely free all right so we are not apple music we are not spotify we are not sirius xm we are not music choice which is your uh, cable music service we offer something that you don't need to pay a subscription for it, and you don't need to sign up for an expensive data plan. It is completely free over the air to listeners, and Congress has agreed with our listeners and our membership, who has implored over the course of decades for establishing and maintaining a legal framework that enables that. I would also say that our members, our stations, are uniquely locally focused. So, you know, you, there is a reason that you have a local radio station, whether you are in New York City, whether you're in Washington, D.C., or whether you're in Helena, Montana. And again, that dissemination um, has led to some balances, some gives and takes that have, uh, that, that have persuaded members of Congress to recognize that those digital services, when they were writing this act in 1995 and 1998, are different. And that when local radio stations simulcast through a stream, they should be treated just as Pandora is treated for its non-interactive service. But what we, when we are doing what the FCC has licensed us to do, which is to offer an analog and sometimes digital signal completely free over the air, uh, to 240 million listeners a week, um, coupling it with local service, news, weather, emergencies, et cetera, there's a different legal framework for that. And uh, are you, are you going to lead? Okay. So <laughs> there is a different legal framework for that, and it really is more an anomaly of history and that we don't have time to go into right now, but um, there have been you know, that has to do with the advent of songwriting 
which was about 200,000 years ago, according to Tim, and the advent of the recording industry, was, which was not nearly as long ago, and the advent of radio, which was between those two things. But uh, we would submit that radio is um, a music service that is ad-supported. They don't do it out of the goodness of their heart. They do it because they make 15 to $17 billion a year selling ads, and they do that against an, uh, the audience that they draw. And they draw that audience largely playing music, which they don't pay for, on the, they don't pay for the sound recording. So that, we think that, to, to say that um, it, there are local radio stations, and often when we talk about um, and argue for the creation of an FM performance right, we, what we hear is, oh, you're going to put small local radio stations out of business. And we have absolutely no incentive or interest in doing that. But we are interested in them, like all of the other digital music services do, uh, sharing the profits that they make from music with the people who make the music. And just to, uh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. To jump in from the digital music services perspective. Um, in addition to the point I made about earlier about how it's complicated, it's also really expensive and the cost of getting it wrong. In copyright, there's statutory damages of $150,000 per work, and so there's so many in, in, individual um, songs that a, a service would need to get to be useful for users. If you want to have there to be a music service, you want to be able to listen to what you want on it. So there's so many different licenses you have to get, the transaction costs, it's really complicated from a copyright standpoint, it's expensive often lose money on it when you're, but you're, when you're trying to do everything legally and making sure the money goes to the owners of the rights and the artists and the songwriters and all the various intermediaries in between. So it's, yeah, it's, it's complicated, it's expensive, there, it, there should be more music played and enjoyed legally, um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of history here. Another thing we didn't get into was that the, uh, haven't, haven't discussed is how the sound recordings were covered by state law until seven, 1972 and so there's all this all these lit this litigation over that, and so it can be really complicated to follow the rules, even when you're trying really hard and you have all the lawyers. So for people that don't have that, it gets really complicated when you just want to listen to music the right way. Yeah. Um, just just to make one point, one we didn't get into even the MMA, which was passed last October, right. which at least for purposes of Section 115 for songs, um, made it a lot easier and more streamlined for digital services like Spotify to license and hopefully now properly pay copyright owners. Um, but, you know, let's not forget that we all love music. We all love listening to music. And some of you out here may be creators and make your own music, either as songwriters or as recording artists. But that those creations are, are, are copyrighted and if you can't license properly, you don't have to use music. Um, it should never be an excuse that it's really hard to license and pay people. So we should have a compulsory license that doesn't let songwriters or artists make a choice about how their music is distributed or how they get paid or how much value they think their song has. Um, so I just want to, like, make sure that we all take that away from here. If there's one thing you take away, it's like when you create anything, you know, as a creator, you want it to have value. You want to be able to say how it's used. Um, and interestingly enough, because of all of the federal regulation, um, a, long, a lot of times songwriters and artists don't get to do that. So um, that's, that's obviously Danielle's perspective. Um, or an organizational perspective, um, <laughs> we just tried to like, get a little bit of an understanding of how this all works. And every time you listen to a song, depending on how you're listening to it, it's probably regulated a little bit differently. And that's something that you know, Congress is involved in and will probably be involved in um, coming up in the next couple of years as well. Um, I, I'm, let me just ask one question from the audience, if we can. And then I'm going to go back to the, uh, the panel and ask, like, who's more powerful as a music mogul, Jay-Z or Congress? So I have any question, if you have a burning question on something you didn't understand or something you want their perspective on, um, please raise your hand. The fellow in the back from C-SPAN has a microphone. No questions? We explained everything. By the way, in order to understand this stuff, you'd have to have, like, a, a, 
a four credit course uh, in college uh, to understand this stuff. And the economics of the rate setting, you need a PhD in economics to understand the rate setting. So if you don't understand it, don't worry. But I just we wanted to give you a better understanding. So let me go back to the question about like who's, who's more of a music mogul, like Jay-Z or Congress, when it comes to control over music and how this all works. Does anybody have any perspective on that? I think I touched on it before, but I certainly think from a songwriting perspective, um, just because of the heavy regulation, I, I, I would I would say Congress. Congress. Beats Jay-Z. I mean, I would say that moguls, kind of an outdated way of thinking about it, is moguls are sort of, historically, they, they make the investment and they create a lot of new value. And I think a lot of the problems in music right now come from private equity. You know, they're the ones really driving consolidation in so many parts of the industry, including radio, and, and driving them away from the local focus that they'd had historically towards a place where they're playing the same homogenous playlists in every city. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have artists or songwriters or other workers in mind, but they don't necessarily have to have uh, the public interest in mind or cultural diversity or the sustainability of all of our precious cultural traditions. So, so I think that's what the real power comes from creators and Congress working together to create a future that works for all of us. Julia? Yeah, I, I like the way that you put that, Kevin. I, um, I think in as much in the, in the space and at the level that the Carter family um, creates uh, and puts music out there, what they have control over, they're clearly in control. Um, but there is a lot that Congress does to control the, their ability to make money from their own work. And that, that's kind of the unfinished business. So I would say Beyonce. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> I'll still say Jay Z, just simply because of the le the absolute level of success. But I'll also say that Jay Z and artists slash songwriters of that caliber are the exception. And there is no doubt that as you look at this ecosystem, and we talked about it from. You know, the services, broadcasters, streaming, et cetera, but all the way down the chain from the performing rights organization to the publisher to the songwriter on one side, on the musical work side, and then from, you know, to sound exchange, the label, and the artist on the sound recording side, the creator is undoubtedly the last one to be compensated in this chain. And that is something that I think. Uh, as policymakers is worth taking a look at is just the balance of interest all the way through the distribution chain. It is easily simplified as to service versus creator, but the reality is there are a lot of parts of this ecosystem. Some of them are dated. Many of them provide value in a lot of different ways, but there, there's no doubt that you have market power issues at different parts of the distribution chain. Uh, you have uh, you know, a, a lot of complication. You've got creators signing away at rights at very, very early ages. So I think there's a lot for Congress to look at here. Uh, but I also want to just sign on to everyone's comments that you know, if you're involved in this business, if you're in this audience, it's because you love music. We are all for ensuring that the most music uh, is out there and consumable by the public in any variety of ways or forms and look forward to just having discussions in, as an industry with, with any of you if your bosses are interested in taking a closer look at this. Yeah, so on the, on the, on the premise of the question, I appreciate you know, Kevin challenging the, the premise. But as I look at it, you know, Congress is in a relationship with two other, people, two other entities, like the judiciary and the executive office of the president. Jay-Z is in a relationship with Beyonce, and so I think she gets the better part of that one. Um, also, like if Congress came together, it, the House and Senate actually, as a, as a resolution, wrote a song. Not that we'd want to listen to it. <laughs> there are some good musicians in Congress, though. Um, and they sang a song, and they composed it. Um, and JD, Jay-Z did the same thing. It turns out that uh, Congress doesn't have the ability to copyright that song. So in that one, Jay-Z wins. Is that, is that correct? I believe that's true. Yeah, um, government... Can't own copyrights. It's yeah. under 105 of the copyrights. So Act. just Jay Z's killing it. Um, I want to thank all our panelists, including Sally and Ricky, Ricky um, and and everybody else that that came and participated. Thanks for coming, um, and uh, hope to see you again soon. Appreciate it.